Good afternoon and welcome to our fourth lunchtime conversation as part of our 55 and Better virtual expo brought to you by the Loveland Reporter Herald and the Greeley Tribune. My name is Al Manzi. I'm president and CEO for Prairie Mountain Media and also publisher for the Reporter Herald and the Tribune. Today's session is very interesting. It's, it's entitled Vascular Health, Leg Veins and How to Treat Them. I'm joined today by Angela Coles, a physician's assistant at American Vein and Vascular Institute. Immediately following Angela's presentation, I'll moderate a Q&A session. Please feel free to enter your questions anytime during the presentation using the Q&A feature or chat feature on your device. So without further ado, please welcome Angela Cole. Hi. Hi. Hello. Sorry, I'm just um, working on sharing here. There we go. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, my name is Angela Cole. I'm a physician assistant with American Vein and Vascular Institute. Um, I have been a physician assistant for 10 years and I've been doing vein procedures and treating vascular patients for about a, a little over six years. And I have been with American Vein and Vascular Institute for a little over five. Um, so I really love what I do and I really like to talk about it. So I'm really excited to get to do this. Um, I'm going to probably just start by sharing a little about our clinics and then um, go into some common symptoms and treatment and hopefully um, address questions that I see a lot in the clinic. Um, so American Vein and Vascular Institute um, is a, a pretty big group. We have seven clinics in Colorado and we were founded in 2009 by my supervising physician, Dr. Gordon Gibbs and his wife. And um, we have a great team of people. They're all wonderful and we all really love what we do. Um, and this is Dr. Gibbs. He is my supervising physician who founded our company. Um, he sits on the American Board of Phlebology and he's also a diplomat of the American Board of Venus and Lymphatic Medicine. Um, basically that just means he sits on the vein boards. So um, he's very knowledgeable and brings a lot of great um, information and leadership to us. And he also works in our Fort Collins clinic um, from time to time along with Dr. Melissa Dunn. So we're the three main providers here at this time. Um, oh, before I get into that, picture. Um, I'm just going to preface this with, I, I like to start by talking about spider veins versus varicose veins, because I think that's probably one of the most common questions that I get about, um, about veins when we're doing consultation or treating. Um, so here are some pictures of some veins, and we're going to have some really nice like after pictures later. So these ones are a little um, intense, but they help make a point. Um, so on over here, the spider veins um, are more considered more cosmetic veins. Um, so those are one to two millimeters in diameter. So they're pretty tiny and everyone's seen them. They do look like almost like the size of a hair on the leg. Um, those are not covered by medical insurance for treatment. And um, that's because traditionally they're not symptomatic, although people can have symptoms in their spider veins. So that's sort of a gray area. Um, but varicose veins are, are considered medical veins and they come with a lot of medical symptoms and medical manifestations that we're gonna talk about. Um, so those are over three millimeters in diameter. In this picture, which is pretty graphic, this is one to three centimeter diameter. So um, they're quite large. Um, so those are definitely treated by insurance, but we'll cover that a little bit more um, just so you kind of understand the difference as far as what it means to be a medical vein versus a cosmetic vein. Um, so oh, this is a really interesting picture. Um, 
it taught, I mean, we're talking, so varicose veins are medical and spider are cosmetic, um, but can they overlap? Um, so you can have spider veins with or without chronic vein disease, but a varicose vein is, is a manifestation or a symptom of chronic vein disease. So that's a medical condition. Um, so how do you know if you just have cosmetic veins? Um, really the best way to figure that out is to come and have an ultrasound um, to see what veins are going on, what the veins are doing under the surface. So the things you can't see with your eyes. But in this picture, I really like it because on the outside of the leg, there's some spider veins and then there's some spider veins on the inside of the knee. And um, this is not um, true of every single person, but typically those ones on the outside of the leg are gonna be asymptomatic. So they're not gonna cause people any trouble and they're not gonna be asso associated with a medical disease. Whereas those ones around the inside of the knee are more typically related to chronic vein disease. Um, so um, spider veins can be a little tricky, but I guess the take home message is that they're not covered by insurance for treatment. And sometimes they are not even related to a medical disease. They're just a cosmetic concern. Um, uh, so um, I wanted to talk, uh, I'm going to leave cosmetic veins alone for a little bit. We'll come back to those and talk about treatment later. But I wanted to talk about chronic vein disease, so the medical disease that causes varicose veins and all that comes with that. Um, so a normal vein takes blood from our extremities, so from our feet and our arms and our head and brings it back to our heart. And your arteries are, we're not really talking about your arteries today, but they're part of this loop as well. So your heart pumps blood and that pumps the blood into your legs and feet and arms. And then we move the muscles in our body. So our calf pump, so when we pump our calf muscle, when we walk, when we use our arms, that squeezes the veins and pushes the blood back towards our heart. And that's the loop. So both of those should be one-way roads. So a normal vein is a one-way road towards the heart and lungs. And the way that that's accomplished is by these little valves that keep blood from going back towards your feet. So um, in a healthy vein, you will walk and you'll pump your calf muscle and it'll squish that blood back up towards your heart. And then these little valves or doorways will snap shut so that the blood can't flush back towards your feet. But in a diseased vein, um, on the other side of the picture, the, the valves don't close properly and the vein wall is weak and it gets distended. And so the blood gets squished up towards your heart when you walk, so nice healthy blood flow towards your heart, but then no doorway closes to prevent that backflow because it cannot because of the vein disease. And so you get congestion of blood in your legs. Um, and I have a couple more cartoons of that too. So here's another, I love this picture because it just is a really great picture of a healthy blood flow. So these little red speckles, those are your blood cells. Um, when you're walking, you're pumping that blood up towards your heart. And then when you stop to rest, or when you're not pumping your calf muscle in your leg, then those little doorways or valves snap shut and the blood doesn't flush back towards your feet. And that's healthy. And then here is our diseased veins. Um, and the blood is flushing back towards the feet in both of these pictures. And the reason it's happening under the valve failure pictures just because the valves are malfunctioning. So they're like Western doors. Instead of snapping shut, they're flapping back and forth. Um, this doesn't mean that the blood just keeps going back towards your feet. It's more of a two steps forward, one step back scenario. So you do get blood going up towards your heart, but then it flushes back towards your feet a little bit. And the more vein disease you get, the more blood flushes back. And as more blood congests in those veins in your legs, you get these distended very close veins. So that's, that's the medical disease. Um, so these are in veins three millimeters in diameter or larger, um, sometimes much larger. Um, and that is what causes all the manifestations of chronic vein disease or the symptoms of chronic vein disease. So I like this picture because you can't see any vein disease on this person, but she could have vein disease because you can't always see it. 
Um, so before, I'm gonna go back to my previous slide. So here, your valve failure patient over here, those veins are not varicose veins yet. They're just malfunctioning. And so you don't see varicose veins, but um, a person may complain of having heavy legs, achy legs. Um, the most common thing that I hear about is, um, is feeling like my legs feel really heavy when I try to walk up the stairs. Like I'm, or I feel like by the end of the day, I'm dragging my, vein, my legs around. Um, and other people have spouses or partners who are complaining of not being able to sleep because um, restless legs and leg cramps at night keep you tossing and turning, um, which affects you and your sleeping partner. Um, itchy dry skin is um, one that people miss a lot just because it almost seems like, oh, I just need to put more lotion on. But really, you're just not getting enough circulation, so the skin's getting really dry and itchy. Um, and then the most common thing is, oh, I thought I was just getting older and slowing down. And, you know, this is just part of, of aging um, when actually it, the heaviness and, and fatigue really in the legs, it's like a tired legs at the end of the day, is, is not always coming from just natural aging. Um, so those are some of the, oh. So the next slide here is we're coming into is gonna be pictures of the disease when it gets at its worst. And I almost hate to share the scary pictures because um, if we address it early on, it doesn't have to develop into all of these different manifestations, but let's just take a look just to go over it. So as, a, as advanced symptoms occur, you start to see the bulgy veins on the surface of the skin. Um, and then the skin changes, this one's kind of tricky because sometimes people think they just have a really dark suntan on their lower calves by their ankle that never goes away. Um, and they don't really even notice that it's more tan there than the other parts of their body. Um, so tan skin um, is not always tan skin if it's really localized to the bottom of the ankle and it's sort of a reddish brownish color. Um, so uh, ulcers can also occur, and those are the really scary pictures. We really like to catch it before it gets there, but these, these symptoms take years, and these things take years to develop. Um, so what you're looking for in the beginning are um, small bulgy veins, leg cramps, leg heaviness, leg fatigue, restless legs, um, and things, things like that. And then family history is going to be a big one because um, your family history tends to be the one common thing that everybody who comes into our clinic with vein disease has. They have someone in their family who has a history, although sometimes they don't always know who it was in their family who gave it to them. There are those patients too, but if you have um, a sibling, a grandparent, a parent, aunts or uncles with this problem, um, it's more likely to happen in you because it is genetic. So um, you can look in your family tree too um, you don't have to wait for things like this to show up and, and they certainly don't happen overnight. So please don't be too scared of our scary pictures. Um, let's talk a little bit about how we can treat spider veins and chronic vein disease. So I'm going to sort of focus right now on chronic vein disease because um, there are some treatments for spider veins, um, but we'll get to those in a little bit. So the initial treatment exercise, I mean, Based on what we're talking about with that calf pumping action that happens when you walk, that any kind of walking, biking, running, anything where you're moving your body and pumping your calf muscle is going to really help with this problem. So it helps overcome the backflow. So it mechanically helps bring the blood back towards your heart. But then it also um, tones the wall of your vein. So, and your arteries, really, that's why everyone asks you to exercise because they want you to have really toned vascular walls. So your veins and arteries are strong and firm and they tend to be more sturdy that way and have less inflammation. Um, so the reason people get pain in their legs from their veins is because the congestion of blood causes inflammatory markers to get released into your into your bloodstream from your vein wall. So it's like a chemical that causes inflammation inside the vein and artery. And they've done so many studies that show that if you exercise, 
the amount of those inflammatory markers being given off by your vein and artery wall um, is reduced. So exercise is great. Um, leg elevation is great. Then you're just, you know, you're having gravity work with you. So legs up the wall pose, which is a yoga pose is really good. Um, sitting in a recliner actually works great because you can get your foot above your heart level. And that's wonderful for blood return. So gravity is working with you instead of against you. Um, a lot of patients notice that if they have a job where they stand all day or if they're driving all day, like on a long road trip, um, they're having more symptoms by the end of the day. And that's because gravity is getting the better of them. Um, so uh, leg elevation is, I think that one's the most underestimated treatment. And then compression stockings or socks are really important. And um, at American Vein and Vascular Institute, we do have a compression center that you don't have to have an appointment or a doctor's referral or anything like that to visit. You can just pop in and talk to a front desk. Um, but we have a variety of compression socks that are made for people with vein disease and for people who exercise. And um, they're very specific. They're fitted to the individual. And I'm going to get into that a little bit. Um, but the, my take home here is compression socks are not as ugly or as un uncomfortable as they used to be. Um, they're still really hard to put on, but we have tricks and we can help with that. Um, so what's really important to know about your compression socks is that um, they're not head hose. And head hose are um, great uh, for surgery and for hospital stays. They help prevent blood clots. They're those white socks that you get when, if you or your family member has ever been admitted to the hospital for any reason, they always get a pair of these white socks. Um, so we're not talking about those um, hospital socks, head hose. We're talking about um, compression garments um, that are graduated. And uh, what that means is, is that the amount of pressure that the sock puts on your foot and ankle becomes less and less as you move up the leg. So um, for veins, you, you actually need 20 to 30 millimeters of compression and millimeters, uh, I'm sorry, millimeters of mercury of compression, which is just a way of measuring pressure. So um, 30 amounts of pressure to the foot and ankle that gradually becomes 20 as you get towards the top of the sock. And what that does is create a gradient that encourages blood to flow up instead of flushing back down. And the only way to get this gradient of compression is to be measured to fit these compression socks. So you cannot, you can't really get that effect if you're buying it over the counter from Walmart, unfortunately, because they are not measured to fit you. Um, so there's no way to guarantee that you're getting the appropriate amount of compression. And in fact, if they're too tight, they can actually cause harm and uh, work against you as far as your symptoms. And if they're too loose, then they're, um, they're not really doing you any good. They might keep you warm. <laughs> um, so next, I wanted to talk about procedures. Um, and everyone around here likes to say, what are you doing for lunch when we talk about vein procedures? Just because... Uh, they're about 15 to 60 minutes on average, so they can be done within a lunch hour. Um, you're not sedated for procedures. Um, they're minimally invasive, um, so you can drive yourself home. Um, we actually ask that you do a lot of walking after your procedures, so routine walking, running errands, um, doing desk work, dishes, gardening. I mean, just kind of your average day-to-day -day chores can and should be done after you have a procedure done. Um, we, we like to keep everybody comfortable um, because you are, you're awake for the entire procedure so we can actually talk the whole time, which is one of the wonderful things. I, I really enjoy having our patients actually be awake when I see them. Um, it's much better than surgery in that way. Um, but we really wanna keep you comfortable and we do a really good job at, it, at doing that. Um, these procedures are low risk. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about risk and things like that. But that's just a general overview and a before and after picture because those are always fun um, to see the varicose veins gone. It's, I mean, when those have been on your leg for a decade or more, it's nice to see them go away. Um, 
Before I talk about our medical procedure, so I'm gonna come back to spider veins where we sort of started. Um, so really important to talk about with spider veins is the process of treating them. Um, they're treated with injections. So we actually inject medicine into those little veins with a very tiny needle. Um, so it's a little pokey, but it's really tolerable. Um, you, you have to have it done about three times to really get the results. So your before picture versus your after picture is three rounds of those injections. And there's about six to eight weeks in between each treatment. And in the middle, like right after you get your treatment done, things look worse before they look better. So um, it is something that requires some patience and some time. If you're planning on going on a trip um, to the beach, you wanna make sure it's, you start this process like six months before that trip. Um, if you're hoping to have your, your legs ready for summer, you're gonna to wanna to start the end of summer the previous year. Um, excuse me. So you, you do, you're in for a little bit of a process. The results are pretty fun though. And um, this is not going to make your legs feel better. This is just make them look better. Um, every once in a while we have patients where they have a vein that really bothers them and it's a spider vein so it burns and itches and it does have some symptoms and that, that can get better. Um, but this is more for appearance and it is very pretty when it is done well. So coming, moving back to um, our chronic vein disease treatment, that's a little bit different. We do use injections to treat veins, but um, I wanted to go over blood flow a little bit using this picture because it's my favorite way to explain how we do what we do. So we actually close veins to improve your blood flow and everybody um, kind of does a double take at that because um, closing a vein that is for blood flow doesn't seem like it would help blood flow, but this is kind of how it works. So I have to give you a little, just a small anatomy lesson here. Um, so we have our arteries here. So you see the blood flow coming, going down to the foot on the arteries. That's the main interstate. And the next to it is your main interstate vein, your deep veins. And so these um, arteries and veins are actually deep in your muscle next to your bone. Um, so they are, they're the main interstate of our leg and they're very important. Um, so the deep veins that you can see, like we talked about before, that blood is on a one-way road to the heart. Um, so we don't, we don't actually do procedures on these vessels, these deep vessels in our clinic. And that is that is actually more a surgical suite or inpatient type of procedure. And it, ha it doesn't have a lot to do with what we're talking about. Um, so I'm not gonna go into that. But the important thing to note here is that your superficial veins, the veins we treat, that the veins that varicose veins are superficial and there's um, other superficial veins that varicose veins come off of that are super, these are all on your skin. So this dark area in the forest over here, that is your skin in this picture. And um, what you have to think of here is that your varicose vein is like a road with a traffic jam. And there are lots of these on-ramps that get, you, get blood onto the main interstate and take it back to the heart. There's many, many on-ramps, but the ones that we target and close have a traffic jam. And if someone could have just closed the road that had a huge traffic jam on it when you were trying to get home after work, it would have made your whole trip like 50% shorter and a lot easier. And so blood will just go to the next on-ramp. And, and when it does that, it will actually relieve the symptoms of all of the congestion of that traffic jam. So I hope that that kind of helps everybody understand why we would close a vein to improve your blood flow. Um, because we're not closing the main veins, we're closing these smaller veins that are not functioning. They're just acting like a big puddle. And that puddle is causing all of the symptoms that people come to see us for. So. Um, I'm gonna just briefly go over some of these treatments. Um, this is how to treat spider veins and chronic vein disease. Um, that's actually not accurate because spider veins don't get treated this way. We're just talking about medical veins in this, in this slide. So sorry about that. But um, here you see a catheter inside a vein. So that yellow thing is a catheter. And um, that is heating up the vein to close it. So this is one of the most common ways that we close veins. 
Um, and the patient does not feel this heat. Like if you were to have this procedure, you wouldn't feel the heat from that catheter at all. Um, you're, you're pretty comfortable actually. You, the easiest part of the procedure is the closure. Um, so that is a radio frequency vein ablation. They have new, a new treatment called venous seal, which is basically super glue. So instead of going in and heating up the vein, um, you can squirt some glue into the vein and glue it shut. That's not covered by most insurances. It is something we offer at our clinics. Um, that actually leaves a piece of glue in your leg for about 10 years, so it's considered an implant. Um, but it is uh, it's a very effective treatment. And then um, phlebectomies, uh, that is where we remove pieces of vein. This is similar to like the old way that these veins were treated. So we didn't used to put a catheter in a vein and heat it to get rid of it. Instead, they would just make a big incision in the leg in surgery under general anesthesia, and then the surgeon would remove the on-ramp of the superficial vein. He would just go in and pull it out. And now we try to heat it to close it. But there are some pieces of the vein that have to be removed. So we do like a, a micro version of a stripping. Um, so we call it a micro phlebectomy or ambulatory phlebectomy, um, where we're just removing little pieces of the vein and we don't use sutures. I mean, that's how small these little incisions are. They're more like a puncture. Um, so there are ways to non-invasively remove these veins and treat them that are actually, they sound fairly intense, but they're, we can actually keep you very comfortable for them and they're very low risk. So um, the ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy, um, and you guys, no one has to remember, we never expect anyone to remember these big words, but we have to kind of call them by their names. Um, that, that is just like cosmetic injections, except we're doing it in medical veins using ultrasound guidance. So the way that we can do all of our procedures is that we use ultrasounds for them. So we don't have to make big incisions to open and go in and look at the veins. We can see them from the outside and just make a tiny little paper cut incision um, to treat those veins. And then the before and after pictures, which are the most fun. So this patient had that catheter treatment. So the catheter treated their vein from here to here in the thigh. And then the injections were done in the calf. And then a, a small phlebectomy was done here to remove these veins. You can see like these little tiny puncture incisions. And then here's after six months. Um, so those are really wonderful results. And um, we always pick really healthy, active people to do our before and after pictures. So I'm just gonna make some, I'm gonna note that right now. So this patient was very active. That's why um, she did not have a lot of swelling and she didn't have a lot of skin changes. She didn't have that brownish sunburn on the bottom of her calf and ankle um, because she was doing a lot of conservative therapies to try to treat her um, disease. So uh, that, that is, it can't be underestimated how, much, how important conservative treatment is in addition to treating with procedures because it really saves your skin. And, and in the end, uh, that's what we're trying to do is to keep people mobile, doing all their activities the way they usually would, um, and also protect their skin health. She is a great example. Recovery, um, then go back to low impact activities immediately after your procedures. Um, and you can return to high impact activities after about one week. And that's a soft rule that we just really encourage people to let their bodies heal. But if you had to like run or um, if you needed to lift something heavy, it's not dangerous. It's actually more uh, the pressure from high impact activities could cause some treatment failure. So it's not actually dangerous, but we really encourage people not to go back to activities until after high impact activities so after a week. Um, and no airplane flights um, for 10 days um, to reduce risk of blood clot. And um, there's uh, no soaking in hot tubs or bathtubs for seven days after the procedures. Um, the risk of getting a complication like a blood clot, which would be the most serious complication you could have from a procedure, is 
very low. Um, it's less than 1%. And it's low enough that if you are he otherwise healthy and have no other risk factors, we don't put you on a blood thinner for these procedures because a blood thinner would be used in this case to prevent a blood clot during procedures, but we don't really need to use those in most people. It's very rare we do. Um, the reason being is that the risk of using a blood thinner is often higher than the risk of having a procedure. So it's not really beneficial to use. Um, so yeah, that I think that kind of covers covers procedures. I gave you a very crash course in procedures, um, but definitely if anyone has questions, please let me know um, at the end. And um, outcomes and recurrence. So relief of symptoms. Uh, sometimes patients actually get off the table and say, oh wow, my leg feels lighter. Every now and again, it's really fun. But usually it takes a couple days um, to start noticing some improvement. Um, so what you would be noticing is whatever your primary symptom you came to be treated for would improve. If you had horrible night cramps, you notice this gradually starts to become less frequent, less intense. Sometimes they even clear up. Um, heaviness, you have lighter legs. We have runners. So people who are running and timing their runs, who have seen their time go down. Um, on their runs when they resume running because their legs feel so much lighter, they can actually run faster, um, which is really fun. Um, my favorite is walking the dog. There's a lot of patients that come in and they're like, I can barely walk my dog anymore because my legs are so heavy and they feel so achy and tired all the time. And then after procedures, they're regularly, they are walking their dog again regularly. So that's probably one of my favorites, but um, lots of good, good results, it makes it a very rewarding field to work in. Um, varicose vein recurrence, so how likely is it that your vein problem is gonna come back? Pretty much 100% likely because we don't cure your vein problem, we manage it. So we manage it by treating the symptoms and the skin changes that we see. Um, if you were to not do any follow-up, you have about 15, I would say I, it's higher than that, but this is most current research, about a 15% chance of seeing veins return after about two to seven years after you have your procedures. The great thing is, is that if you follow up and come every one to three years for an ultrasound, we can usually catch those veins before you actually see them on the surface of your skin because we're checking with ultrasound. And then we can treat them with injections and I, my motto is um, if I have to do a phlebectomy where I'm removing a varicose vein, my goal is let's never do this again. Let's do as few procedures over your lifetime as we can and um, try to catch this problem a little earlier now that we know that it's there. So, let me see. Okay, I think that's all I have. Angela, that was outstanding. Um, really, really interesting information. Um, I've got I've got some questions for you. And I'm sure our, our uh, participants will as well. Um, can you talk about uh, uh, the the occurrence of varicose veins in terms of men versus women and age ranges? Yes. Yeah. So um, usually we're seeing varicose veins in women, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, female hormones actually cause the vein wall to be less sturdy. So um, women are just generally more prone to the disease. So is um, there hormone treatments um, that, that can help as well? No, it's kind of a natural part of being female. Um, if you are not genetically predisposed to having varicose veins, it's unlikely that your female hormones are just gonna cause you to have varicose veins. But if you have a genetic predisposition, um, you're more likely to see varicose veins as a female than a male because your body naturally has hormones that cause our veins to be soft. And, and those are important hormones. We want that to happen because um, during pregnancy, we need everything to soften up in the female body in order to give birth. So it's actually a normal healthy function of the body um, to have female hormones softening our, 
our veins, if you will. That's kind of the way I like to describe it. But um, that means that women are more prone. And, and when a woman carries a baby, she um, increases the volume of blood in her body. And that also causes veins to become more distended. Um, and there's a lot of pressure on her vascular system from the baby that she's carrying just physically. Um, so a lot of women are seeing varicose veins after their first, second, third child, and they get worse progressively if they continue to have more children. Um, so it can happen anywhere in, from the 30s to the 50s and 60s. I don't think anyone has studied this, but I really noticed that if your mom got varicose veins when she was 65, it's more likely that you're gonna see your veins at 65. If your mom got her varicose veins at 30 after she gave birth, that's more likely gonna be your, your manifestation of the disease. So it seems like the genetic component has a big role to play. And what about for men? Um in terms of, do they just have, do they just have less varicose veins? Um, it seems like they manifest less frequently in men than women, statistically, like when they do these studies. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I'm treating patients in the clinic, it's pretty consistent that a patient will come in and say, my dad had this, my grandpa had this, my uncle had this. Um, it, runs in the, it runs in the men in my family. Um, so that is, it's very uncommon for me to see um, a gentleman who says, I don't know where this came from. No one in my family had this. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, that seems to be the primary thing is your family history. So, so um, you mentioned runners. Um, do you see it more in people who continue to exercise vigorously as they age? Or is it more common people who are less active? So this is really interesting. You will get the disease whether or not you're active. If it, if, if it runs in your family and you're predisposed to it, you will get it. And that's, and we're talking about like 25 to 30% of the population has some sort of predisposition to this. But the really interesting thing about runners, so people who exercise vigorously versus sedentary people, is that... Um, the people who exercise vigorously usually have more varicose veins by the time they see us. And the reason is, is that they don't tend to get the symptoms of pain that sedentary people get. Because of that piece, that component I was talking about, when you exercise, um, the amount of inflammatory markers that are produced by your veins and arteries reduces significantly. And if you don't exercise a lot, you're gonna be producing more of those inflammatory markers. And so you're gonna show up on our doorstep a lot sooner than our athlete patients because you're gonna be hurting and it's really gonna be affecting the quality of your life. You're also gonna have more swelling. So our active patients tend not to swell as much. And um, swelling, we can get like swelling from numerous things, but um, when you have chronic vein disease and you get like swelling, you do get to a point of no return. So if you wait too long, we can make it better, but we can't make it go away. Um, so exercising, it doesn't change the likelihood of getting the disease. It changes the development of it, like how it manifests in your body. That's fascinating. So, so you mentioned about, about the, you know, the, the, the improvements in hose and stocker stockings and, um, uh, I was in leggings and things like that. Do you, do you recommend to people that maybe are predisposed to it and are younger and might only have spider veins that they start wearing them, um, those support systems earlier in life to, to help uh, support that vascular system? No, actually. Um, so the interesting thing about compression socks is they kind of work like glasses or contacts. When you put them on, the symptom that you're trying to treat gets better. And when you take them off, the symptom comes back. Um, so like if you get um, heaviness and you wear your socks, your heaviness gets better. And then you take off your sock and your leg feels heavy again. Um, it doesn't actually prevent the disease from progressing. Um, it doesn't keep you from getting veins. They've done lots of studies. 
but it does treat symptoms really well. So if you actively have symptoms of disease, it's gonna treat those symptoms and help with your quality of life. And then swelling, so chronic swelling can happen for a variety of reasons. And when you hit that point of no return with swelling where you've been swollen for so long that you can't go back, you can never really quite get rid of the swelling, compression socks are actually extremely important. So it's gonna be more people later in life who have chronic swelling that really should consider compression socks because it so protects- are you, are you are you in a, a greater danger of uh, uh, air, air travel um, uh, related clotting uh, or blood clots if you have varicose veins as opposed to not having them? Yes, you are. And they have done numerous studies on this. Um, on that question. Everyone's at risk though. And honestly, everyone should wear some kind of a compression sock on a plane. If, if I had my way, I would just like hand them out at the airport. <laughs> or, even if or, you know, or just move around a lot, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, moving around helps, but it's, you know, if every person on an airplane took a little stroll down the aisle, um, they, not everyone would get in a stroll. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you're, you're not you all. You can do, you can do um, calf uh, yeah. Yeah. releases and, and tightening and things like that to, to help as well, correct? Absolutely, yes. But I, so I'm a proponent of socks, on, a compression socks on airplanes. But yes, you do have a higher risk of getting a blood clot on an airplane if you have varicose veins, absolutely but everybody has a risk of getting a blood clot on an airplane, so. And so are those um, uh, 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 compression socks, are they, are they available for coverage through HSA or, or are they just out of pocket? Um, actually, HSA is sort of an exception. We, yeah, you can use um, a medical, um, you can use saving your um, HSAs and those types of accounts um, to purchase your compression garments. That's very accepted. The only problem we run into is that you can't submit to an insurance company to get reimbursed for your compression socks. Um, as, as a provider and as a clinic, we have had such little luck with it that we have stopped doing that. Um, we do have some patients who will submit their own claims to their insurance and maybe half of them will get something back. So I, I, I don't think it hurts to try, but as a general rule, um, compression garments are not being covered by insurance. And that, I mean, that's changed even from when I started doing this. I feel like at least half the insurance companies were still paying for compression garments and now it seems like nobody is. So um, that's definitely a trend, but yes, you can still use health savings accounts and things like that to, to pay. Let me ask you some, some other like kind of common sense questions. Like, are there supplements that you can take um, that help with the development of uh, varicose veins or spider veins? Yes, um, I, I love this question because um, there is a supplement. It's called Diastin. Um, and I can, I'm not sure how I would share that information with everybody here. Maybe we can figure out a way to. Uh, yeah, Lindsay, Lindsay's listening. If you just, um, if you just uh, talk to Lindsay right after this, she can put it out um, and have right. it, it spelled properly because I couldn't spell it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so there. So that's an over-the-counter supplement that helps with, what does it do? Does it, does it thin the blood? No, it actually reduces that inflammatory process that's happening in the walls of the vein. Hmm. It, so it's a bioflavonoid. So vitamin C is a type of vitamin called a bioflavonoid. Mm -hmm. And they're really great for our tissue. And um, diosmin has actually been studied by the FDA. There's an FDA food version of it called Vascularo, although that one's terribly expensive. And I don't actually recommend it much anymore just because the out-of-pocket cost. Um, but there's another version of it made by a vascular surgeon who is like, this vascular is too expensive. Why don't we just make our own? It's a supplement. And then you don't need a prescription. Um, so that would be the one I usually share with people and you can get it on Amazon. Excellent. And what about massage? Does massage help at all? Um, so 
massage is not particularly helpful for vein disease. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some types of swelling because um, we see all kinds of swelling here that do benefit from massage. Um, but if you're strictly talking vein disease, then massage doesn't necessarily help. It might help you feel better, which is mm -hmm. always wonderful. So, you know, um, uh, I'm going to ask you two questions here, um, uh, simply because I know people will have this on their mind is, can you give a range for the three treatments for spider vein, uh, which is the cosmetic portion, and then the, tr the insurance covered one for, um, uh, for varicose. What, what, what ranges are, are somebody looking at if they decided, hey, I, I think I wanna do this cosmetic surgery, well, not cosmetic, cosmetic treatment um, for my spider veins. So the cosmetic treatment for spider veins, I believe right now is $375 for a block of time. I think it's a 15 minute block and I can, I can treat a lot of veins in 15 minutes. Um, but it just depends on the person. I mean, usually you get some sort of a discount if you purchase three blocks of time at once. So if you want to purchase all three of your treatment sessions up front, then they give you a discount off of it's an, it turns, it comes down to like three fifty I think per treatment. Um, and these are not exact numbers, but um, mm -hmm. we can, if you call into our clinic anytime, we can give you exact numbers. So 1200 uh, to $1,400 roughly for the yeah. two, three treatments is, is, a, is a good range. Yeah. And, and that's the insurance covered, the insurance covered portion of um, varicose veins, is that 100% coverage in most cases or is it, is it uh, partial coverage? Um, so that depends on your insurance and some people have wonderful insurance. Um, so when, when I see the best coverage is when people are using Medicare, uh, with a supplemental mm -hmm. and that, that seems to get the best coverage. Um, when you're using private insurance, it is all over the map. And right. usually how we do it in our clinic is once we make sure you because um, every single insurance company has a different require a treatment requirement uh, guideline. So once we make sure you meet your insurance's guidelines, we submit to them to get approval for your treatment and they will approve what they think is appropriate. And then they will give us numbers and then we will create an out-of-pocket estimate and give that to our patient. Um, so that's something we take care of on our end. So we kind of give the cost up front as best as possible, but it can range anywhere from, depending on your out-of-pockets from like $5 out-of-pocket, which would be really nice. You know, that's like the best insurance to, I've seen people have out-of-pockets upwards of um, several thousand dollars, so. Let me ask you, that, that, those are, those, that, that's a great answer on both cases. Thank you, Angela. Um, uh, what about inversion tables? You know, uh, they, they're becoming more and more more popular for back issues and knee issues and things like that. But, uh, you know, I've used inversion tables for a long time. So I know the feeling of, of being on an inversion table for a couple of minutes and how that feels when you return back to, 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 to standard gravity. Um, does that help um, the, uh, the, the, the vascular uh, health of your veins? Yeah, so anytime you get your feet to be above your heart in any position, really, like you could, like I said, legs up the wall where, where you're flexed at the hips, um, in your recliner, um, on an inversion table, if your feet are elevated above your head and heart, um, or, you know, just even if you get halfway there, gravity is working for you. And, and that's really the problem with vein disease, right? Um, the, the blood wants to flush back to your feet and there's nothing really holding it, stopping it from doing that because the valves don't work. So if you can get gravity working for you, that's wonderful. And that actually does help with the symptoms. Excellent. And what about that? You mentioned the glue treatment. Um, what happens after 10 years? Does the glue just dissolve and you need to get it replaced? Or is that the kind of thing where it just depends on the individual? Um, well, once the glue is in position, uh, the vein actually forms like scar tissue around the glue. And, and we're talking like a string of glue, like taffy. Like if you took a piece of taffy and mm -hmm. then just put a little 
tiny piece off of your piece of taffy and stretched it as thin as you could, um, the vein wall is wrapped around that and it turns into a scar and your body actually absorbs that scar long, many years before it absorbs the glue that closed the vein. So the vein's gone by the time the glue is gone. So you wouldn't need to repeat it. Does your body continuously in the legs, like in the heart, develop additional collateral circulation as you age? Um, it depends on how you use your legs, but yes, it, there is a potential for that. Um, Cause I, I've had patients ask me, well, what if you run out of on-ramps? I'm like, that is a great question. And mm -hmm. we don't tend to, cause there are so many of those collaterals in our superficial system. Well, Angela, this was a great session. I really enjoyed um, your presentation and I'm sure our, our listeners did as well. Um, great answers to all the questions. I'm so appreciative. Um, we thank you so much and we hope to see you again at, a, at, a later, at another session of our aging programs. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.